I stared at it for I don't know how long. I kind of blanked out because all the old stories were coming back. Something climbed up on that float house and almost flipped it over. My name is Jim Whitehead and I've always had a little bit of an interest in it due to the fact that we had kind of a local legend out where I grew up and you know people people knew people that had seen th things roaming the creeks and whatnot and back in 2006 uh i had an encounter with something in the fog that i it was real dense pea soup fog and i couldn't see it due to the fog but it was prowling around out back by the creek and I uh, discovered a 15-inch barefoot track down in the mud. And after that, I guess you could say I was hooked. And and what area do you live did you live in that with that had this activity? Uh, this was uh, kind of central Oklahoma, uh, about 30 miles south of Oklahoma City. There's quite a bit of activity still going on in that area, is there not? Uh, not as much as there was in that particular location. There's been a lot of development in that area. The uh, Between people building big uh, housing additions in there, the oil field coming in and building pipelines and uh, refineries and stripping a lot of the land, it's driven a lot of the local wildlife off. I see. Well, going back to this uh, thing that happened to you in 2006, and you found this 15-inch track, um, what did you do when you found it? Were you able to get a print of it? Did you know what it was immediately? I mean, how did you respond to that? Honestly, I stared at it for, I don't know how long. I kind of blanked out because all the old stories were coming back. But... Uh, I promptly went to uh, town, got plaster, tried to make a cast, and basically made the worst cast in, cast in existence because I pulled it too early, and it, yeah, it turned into a mess. Did it just crumble on you? <laughs> uh, no, but uh, it was in a it was kind of in really soggy, wet mud, and some of the some of the edges of the casts kind of kind of broke off and like I said I, I wouldn't use it as evidence right exactly use. so you just had that so you said that there had been um other um experiences that people were having in, in that area what did you know about that was going on in the area before this well my uh brother was out hunting one night and uh his dogs had got scared and they were refusing to leave his side. And he was up a creek we call Mushroom Gully. And Tim had this feeling that he was being watched. And he got up on the embankment and looked across and he seen something standing there watching him back up in the brush. And at first he said he thought it was a bear and then it reached up and grabbed a branch over Ed. And, you know, bears cannot really do that and Tim got spooked and then he uh, basically went about two miles out of his way to avoid having this thing follow him back to the house and that wasn't his only encounter he uh, was also there were a couple of big watershed ponds up to the north of us and he basically built like a little float house out there on one uh, had a little walkway around the outside. Uh, there was a little shed on the top on it. Had a little space heater in it. And uh, one night, something climbed up on that float house and almost flipped it over. And Tim said, "You can, you know, you could hear it walking around the float house." Then it dove into the water and swam off. But uh, there was that. Uh, my dad was going out hunting with a couple of his friends and they were over on a creek about that's uh, about five miles from uh, the house I grew down there and 
what had happened was they said they seen a uh, a reddish brown hairy thing leaning up against a fence post and you know they they uh, were kind of surprised at it and they said it looked basically like something between a little kid and a monkey and they went uh, back to get the dogs and came back and tried to turn them loose to see if they track it and the dogs refused to get out of the dog box so that that was another one there was uh a story of a guy that lived about four miles to the north of us that uh, he uh, heard something out in his chicken coop and he went out there and uh, something came out of the chicken coop with chickens under both arms and he proceeded to blast it with a shotgun and it rolled around on the ground screaming and then got up and ran off. Uh, that guy had actually came and got dad to come out there and look the next day, I said, I didn't like the idea of this thing running around wounded. And dad said that there were chunks of meat and hair on the ground that day when he got there in blood. Uh, the blood. The blood trail and the path where it went went up the creek a couple miles and kind of petered out. Dad figured whatever it was, it probably pulled up somewhere in the brush that was pretty thick and bled out and died. And so, uh, did did he get a look at this thing to know for sure that it was a Bigfoot, or or did he just speculate that, or uh, the guy that shot it? Yeah. Well, it was standing upright and it had chickens under both arms. So there's that, and there's the fact that he's that uh, Tony is about six four, and whatever it was was considerably taller than him so it was no coyote right <laughs> yeah it wasn't no coyote right um and 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 your dad saw this thing as well so that's that's pretty close to home your brother your dad and a neighbor all had <laughs> seen something that that they thought so so when you saw this 15 inch track out there in the mud um you probably had a pretty good idea what you were dealing with uh, yeah, more or less. Uh, and and there's nobody else really in that bottom. So it wouldn't have been, it was very unlikely to have been something that was somebody had planted, mainly due to the fact that uh, aside from my uncle and aunt, which lived across the creek, which were in their 80s, and I don't see them doing it, um, it was pretty much just me down there. The nearest actual neighbor is probably about three to four miles away. Was there just one track, just one one print? Uh, one print in the mud. There were other impressions in the leaf litter where it had, uh, went up the creek. Could you make out a trackway at all? A little bit. And then Did you have uh, any inkling to follow it and kind of see where it went? Um, yeah, I actually followed it up to one of the watershed ponds, and then I kind of lost track of it there because it uh, looks like it hit an old oil field road. Did it set you in motion to um, to start researching? Was it at that time that you did start researching, or was that later on? Well, it was pretty much that because I... Uh, I was trained as a field biologist and I could not call myself a scientist and let it go. So what did you do? Well, for, at first I tried to assimilate any knowledge I could, which early 2000s, you translated into watching a lot of Bigfoot documentaries. So basically I probably did everything you shouldn't do. Uh, I had tr had a long running baiting program that I was basically trying where I had uh, went up to an area where everybody dumped the dead cattle because I figured it would be an available food source. So anything that's in the bottoms would uh, come up there and, you know, look to see if there were, there was fresh meat. So 
I uh, put a bunch of sand down to try to encourage something to leave footprints. And then I proceeded to hang bags of fruit in the middle of all this sand. I put a T-post down with a uh, baker chicken that I wired to it. And the idea was something might come in to check, check out some of the, you know, the fruit or the chicken. And it's going to walk over there in the sand and leave prints. And then I had uh, four game cameras in a perimeter facing it. And about all I succeeded in doing was getting photographs of every raccoon in the area. So nothing came in to, to, to take advantage of any of that other than other wildlife? Pretty much. Uh, yeah, I, nothing I would call definitive by any means. Did you just, did you just do that one time? You just faded that situation one oh, time. It was something no. else. No, <laughs> this, was, this was ongoing. I put it out there for about a month uh, or two. Every week I would, every week I would go up and change the bait out. That was a lot of work. Yeah. So um, what else have you tried um, in order to get more information about Bigfoot? Well, uh, after, uh, after that was over, I basically uh, joined up with the, uh, with one of the Bigfoot groups here in Oklahoma, the Mid-America Bigfoot Research Center. And as a, a group can amass knowledge a lot quicker than a single individual. And, you know, I learned a lot of research tactics from them and we've, had mixed mixed results but you know i wouldn't call it a, a failure or a complete waste of time well have you um have you ever uh, taken a report or gone out on a research project where there was something that really amazed you oh yeah uh yeah uh, i took a report from near shawnee oklahoma back to the north and uh a dad was out walking with his two boys and uh he got something happened and he got to arguing with uh, the kids and he got pegged in the head with a rock a piece of gravel he wasn't hurt so after that uh i went up there and started researching with him and there was there was one time it was uh 2008 and it was just no 2009 I believe and it was just a few days before Christmas I was off work had some time to kill so I went up there and uh, set an audio recorder on the top of my truck and a uh, parabolic and I just basically intended to sit there throughout the night and listen and it was about dusky dark and there was a little car back down in the that area that it was parked and what what it was is there was a guy out there who was deer hunting and he uh through the through the parabolic i could hear leaves crunching and i could hear it you know it was, it was significant there was a lot of brush being moved this guy comes running out of the woods with his deer stand, opens the door of the car, throws the deer stand in the back of the seat of the car <clears throat> hard enough that it actually shattered one of the uh, passenger windows. And this guy is spooked. I get out of there and I try to ask him what's going on. And he said, said he's getting out of here. And if I was smart, I would do because something's out there and it's following him. And Again, the sun is not fully set yet, so you can still kind of see. And this guy speeds out of there, probably a little too fast. So I get back in the truck and I put on the the uh, parabolic and or the, or the headphones for the parabolic. And as I'm listening, I can hear crunch, crunch, crunch getting closer. And right at the edge of the tree line, something steps out and it stares at the truck for a few seconds and then turns around and walks back into the tree line. 
And whatever it was, I would estimate it uh, based on the height of the cedar trees there to have been easily nine feet. How good of a look did you did you get? Were you able to see any kind of facial features or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Uh, no, it was too dark to really make out a lot of the features, but you could, uh, the, basically you were looking at the shadowed area and the light was illuminating the edges of it. So you, you could see hair, arms, a general shape, just that it was hairy and big. But how long did you get to, to take a look at that? It probably stood there for about a minute to a minute and a half before it turned around and walked back in. That's quite a while. Most people don't get to see them quite that long. And I will say this, that area was fairly active then. Uh, I actually turned that research site over to another researcher that's uh, since passed away. But I had several people working under me because I became a director in the group. And I was trying to make sure everybody had their own site. Did they find anything else up there? Were there any other um, encounters that you know of in that area? Uh, yeah, there was a uh, coon hunter that was down in there. This is from the former landowners that owned it. And they uh, said this hunter refused to go back down that area. He uh, Apparently, he had a dog twisted in half. The... Uh, the guy uh, was following his dog and he said a, uh, he called it a giant caveman, stepped out of the brush, grabbed his dog and snapped it. And he observed that? Yes. Did he describe the caveman as he referred to it? He said it looked like the old, you know, pictures of the caveman you would see in the National Geographic and stuff back in the 50s, covered in hair. And he said it was probably about eight, eight and a half feet. Do you know the year that happened? I didn't quite hear that. Do you know what year that happened? Uh, from what David was telling me, that would probably have been the early 80s. So those things have been around there a while. In that particular location, yeah. But you said they've kind of slowed down now? Well, this is, they, they have in my area. I haven't researched that area in 10 years. I There's see. A, they're about 80 miles apart. Mm -hmm. Well, what else have you, um, well, have you personally had any other encounters? A few. You know, I've seen Would a you... lot of, I've seen a lot of silhouettes and stuff like that. And it's, I, I mean, you really can't count those, but some researchers do. But there have been a few sightings that I would say are pretty, pretty hard for me to dismiss. Uh, there was one. It was uh, that's a few years back. I used to work at a warehouse in Oklahoma City while I was going through college, and as I was driving home. It was about two, <coughs> excuse me, it was probably about two to three in the morning, and I was crossing, crossing the same creek where my brother had uh, seen one while he was out hunting, and something ran across the road in front of my truck, and it was illuminated in the headlights. Uh, whatever it was, it had to duck under a willow branch that was substantially off the ground and crossed the road in about two steps and slid down a rocky embankment. I went back the next day and measured the willow branch because I distinctly remembered seeing its head go down below the branch. And the branch was nine feet off the ground, which means the head was probably a comparable height. And when I went down and checked the rocky embankment, I collected uh, some hair samples and found 18-inch impressions in the leaf litter down below and followed them for a ways. I took the hair samples to back to the college. The 
professor that was working there was uh, one of the board members for the Oklahoma Academy of Science, one of, the, one of the best biologists I know. He was familiar with all the local wildlife. He couldn't identify it. So I took the hair and scanned it into a digital microscope and took some photos. And I was trying to find a uh, match. And there was a group based out of Texas that had done some research up where the El Reno chicken man incident had occurred. And they had collected some hair samples. And they actually gave me a little bit of their hair. And when I compared the two hair samples, they were a match. Uh, the scale pattern was the same. The overall structure of the hair was the same. The only real difference was there was a difference in coloration. Uh, one of the hairs was black. One of the hairs was kind of a reddish color. So you got some confirming information there that this could possibly be the, the same Bigfoot you think, or you think... Um, another one of its species. One of its species, yeah. Uh, now, what was kind of interesting about it is that group in Texas actually sent samples of the hair they collected off to four different labs. One lab refused to look at it and just said that it had to be a bear. But the other three labs morphologically could not identify it to any native North American animal. In fact, their general response was, we want more. So having heard that, they sent it off for genetic testing. And they actually got a geneticist to look at it. And the geneticist wrote back to them that they could not find a match in Zobank, meaning this was an undescribed species. Zobank is a catalog of basically every genome, that, everything that's been sequenced. It's not in the sequencing. So that means whatever their unknown is, my unknown is. So how do you get this sequencing started? Um, I guess they'd have to know where this hair came from, what species it came from. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, it, genetic testing is a mixed bag of nuts uh, because a lot of times you they use primer tests and to, I should put this, you have to have a type specimen to compare against. All they can do is basically get a rough, a rough sequence on it uh, and then compare. Like I said, I don't know the details further than what I was told by the Texas group. I don't know how far into the sequencing they got. But like I said, the official paper they got back said it had no responding match, a corresponding match. A lot of people think DNA is going to be the answer to verify these things. What are your thoughts on that? It's not, not without a type specimen, because all you're going to get is an unknown. You have to have something to compare it to to verify it, meaning you have to have a sample from a known target or something in the collection. So without that, you're not going to be able to verify it with genetic information. What do you think will be the, the key to being able to get some kind of absolute verification on it? It's going to take physical remains. That's just the way science works. That being said, I do believe it's entirely possible that there may actually be misidentified material in museums as of right now. Uh, you know, uh, fossil remains, maybe. You know, there was... Back in the, the early half of the 20th century in the 1800s, well, actually, the 1800s was a little different, but anything that was found in North America was automatically... Uh, labeled as an American Indian, the remains. Mainly because science stated that 
those were the first people here, so anything here had to be a Native American. And that being said, when you go back and look through some of the journals of anthropology, there is some stuff in there that I would honestly question. Uh, there was a skull cap from Nebraska that was from something probably around seven feet tall, and it does not look like a modern human skull cap, but it was labeled as an Indian. And when they, uh, and to give you an idea of the mindset at the time, when people would question the primitive features of this skull cap, well, they said, well, that's because Indians are primitive. Their words, not mine. But when you take into consideration that they were doing that, and then you take you stop to think about how rediscoveries happen all the time in museum or new finds are made in museums because something's misidentified, sometimes wildly off the mark, there is a real chance that there are remains in museums now that are just labeled as Native American remains or something else. With this one in Nebraska, is is that in a museum at this time? Uh, no, I believe it was reappropriated to the tribes. Uh, there was actually a program in the 1970s that was kicked off by, uh, I'm trying to remember his name. He was the head anthropologist at OU, and he petitioned the federal government to basically allow the tribes to come in and claim most of the remains that were, you know, on exhibit or in collections and for reburial. Now, if you've got really unusual or an exceptional remains in terms of size, I kind of have the feeling those might have been really tempting targets for the tribes to claim, you know, hey, our ancestors were huge. That means we were the best. Well, I, th I think that's interesting. I didn't realize the, uh, that there had been something of that nature nature found. But so you think it could be out there. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but if there were something that was suspected of being a Bigfoot rather than as it is mislabeled, would they be able to get some DNA from that and um, and compare it like to, um, to the hair or, or anything else that you might have? It would be... It would have to depend upon the uh, condition of the material, uh, what the material was. For example, teeth make great little time capsules because the enamel is the hardest part in the body. And that means the genetic material inside the teeth would be preserved. Uh, you know, the uh, material inside of caves would actually tend to be preserved more favorably than, let's say, just something that was out in the field and buried. Again, it's due to the conditions. Now, I will say this, there has been some interesting developments coming out of Mexico recently where they found a, uh, they were investigating a cave with some really archaic looking stone tools. And they found blood on the stone tools. And the blood was sequenced and the lab immediately declared it contaminated. But when they looked at the uh, sequencing on it, a lot of the, well, not, not a lot, but a, a significant portion of the academic community went, hey, uh, wait a minute, that might not be contamination. The sample that they got off of the stone tools came back as almost human, almost. It had a variance of 0.009%, which I found very interesting because uh, that is more than the variance between modern humans and Neanderthals, but less than ch chimps and humans. So that's really close, um, but they don't know for sure what it is. No. But they don't know for sure what this hair is and, and other things too. So maybe getting a, a wider variety of um, resources to be able to get some kind of a, a match with some DNA. Uh, 
Yeah. Now, one thing that might be interesting is if you could get, for example, that paleo DNA and then compare it to, you know, a modern sample like the one the group had in Texas to see how close they are. That's see, see, that's been one of the biggest crutches, I think, in the Bigfoot communities. Every time they get something interesting like that, the group will tend to hold on to the results and say, you know, it, mine, instead of usually putting the information out and making it public. So it's a lack of, of sharing or really being cooperative with getting further information because people are holding on to the whatever they do have. I would say that's a big portion, yeah, a big portion of it because uh, I honestly think if you could actually get all the Bigfoot groups that are serious going at this in a scientific manner to work together for a common goal and openly share information, I think we would get a lot further, a lot faster. Well, I think that's a good idea. Um, so what do you think these things are? Well, ultimately, I can only hypothesize because, again, we don't have a type specimen. But I can speculate based on the available information and the data we've seen. Now, I will say this. And this is something I have seen with a lot of people get involved with this. In real science, you follow the data. And if the data doesn't support your hypothesis, you trash the hypothesis and get a new one to better explain the data. It's, again, this is how science works. But when you deal with a lot of these uh, quote unquote fringe sciences, which I really don't like that term, a lot of times the person will have a predetermined mindset and when they get data that doesn't support what it, whatever it is they are looking into, they'll trash the data instead. So that having been said, uh, do I, it's obviously a primate. Now, do I think it's Gigantopithecus? No, I do not. And there are several reasons for that. Number one, uh, there's no real evidence Gigantopithecus was bipedal. And I know Grover Krantz stated that they were, but he was using the uh, it having a U-shaped jaw, which is actually indicative of pongids, orangutans. And Gigantopithecus was an orangutan relative, so if you were to, you could actually look at scans of a or slides of an orangutan jaw, and you'll see they have a U-shaped jaw too, just like Gigantopithecus. But orangutans are not bipedal, and this is a common trait with that lineage. So, you look at the other information concerning Gigantopithecus. There's no evidence it was bipedal. Uh, the diet, there was a very well done research paper done a few years back, and they concluded that it was a grazer. So that's not what we see in Bigfoot reports. And, you know, there's the fact that uh, this group of apes tend to have very well developed uh, laryngeal sacs, which are basically inflatable um, throat pouches. And we never see that in Bigfoot reports. So that rules that group out for me entirely. Uh, the footprint anatomy is closer to our own than it would be a Gigantopithecus. So that would imply that it is probably a hominid of some sort. Um, and as far as that, you know, it's just speculation, but there are a lot of papers that are out right now when you look into the fossil hominids where the data is converging with what we've seen with Bigfoot. Perfect example, uh, the inline trackways that people report with Bigfoot, they are actually described in some of the archaic hominids because the structure of their hips would have made them walk that way. The mid, the mid-tarsal flexion joint uh, that Dr. Meldrum 
has talked about. It is being described in fossil hominids. So there's a lot of data pointing that direction. Well, where do you think um, they would have originated from? Why are they here? How did they get here? Do you have any knowledge on that? Again, I can only speculate, but my guess would be they probably came into North America the same way that uh, buffalo, wolves, and jaguars did um, through the um, Bering Strait or Beringia. Uh, it probably would have happened sometime within the, between 2 million years ago to about 400,000 years ago. And we know there were hominids in Siberia. Uh, there are stone tools that have been found in the extreme northern latitudes in Siberia. And, you know, these are quite primitive. Uh, I believe some of the ones they're finding in Siberia are 740,000 years old. In addition to that, they've also found some on uh, some of the islands in between Siberia and Alaska. So there's pretty good evidence that these uh, hominids may have actually may, went on from Siberia into uh, Beringia. Well, going back to you know your your local research, you're still researching in Oklahoma, is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. So um, do you have a pretty active area right now that you're researching in? Uh, not so much right now. I've been focusing more on doing some other projects that uh, I've been working on. But there is a spot in Northwest Oklahoma that I've, I have been kind of going to because this area has produced some of the best evidence that I have seen so far. Like We've what? Had, like what kind of evidence are you finding up there? Well, we had, uh, we've had a daylight sighting out there and we got a, we got a good thermal hit out there. And again, this was with a little handheld thermal. It didn't have video options, so we're clicking pictures, but it shows what appears to be a head, shoulders, and arms peering up above the brush. There, there has been some good audio re recorded, some uh, possible footprints. I wouldn't label them anything more than impressions, really, but they were in a definitive trackway. And it's an area that, again, it's got a local legend and there's a lot of, when you get to look into it, there's a lot of activity reported there. Have you talked to anyone in the area that's had an encounter from that site? Uh, well, the irony is, is everybody in that area thinks it's a ghost. But why is that? Have you figured out why they, they think this Bigfoot's a ghost? This is actually a really common thing. When one of my one of my little tricks for finding a new research area is I'll actually go to these paranormal threads, their forums, and I'll start looking into these areas that are kind of rural and start reading what people are saying. And you'll you'll start reading stuff like we saw the ghost, it was eight foot tall, had red eyes, it got into my ice box and stole my ham. Or the ghost was throwing rocks at us and screaming. Well, that's interesting. I don't think I've ever heard someone um, misconstrue a Bigfoot for um, a ghost. Now, are, there, are they seeing anything else that makes them think it's a ghost rather than a Bigfoot? Well, I kind of blame the... Uh, you remember a few years back when we had all these ghost shows on... Um, TV. It started with Ghost Hunters, and it just kept going on and on and on and on. It, you know, it there was a bunch of people that jumped on the bandwagon, and we all have a worldview, and when we have, we see something that doesn't fit into it, we try to fit it into our worldview, and what I have found is somebody that's already got an interest in ghosts and they're thinking about ghosts, if they see something weird, that's automatically what they're going to assume it was. Uh, you, I've seen the same thing with uh, aliens. I've got two examples that I've actually investigated one of them personally. 
uh, well, one of them, there was a group talking about a seance down in Ada. And they say that this area is supposed to be haunted by what they call the mountain man ghost. And the mountain man ghost, as they call it, is supposed to be the spirit of a dead fur trapper that is eight feet tall, covered in bear hides, and howls at night. Well, that automatically has got my interest right there. But this group had a, again, they set out candles in this location and tried to have a seance to summon this thing. And they said it was a success because they started getting pelted with rocks. So this has already kind of got my whiskers twitching. So I go down there the next week and Again, this is kind of a public area. I found where they had their seance. You can see the melted wax. And I'm looking around to, because I don't think this had anything to do with them, you know, chanting and lighting candles. The first thing I noticed is there's a pond nearby and it appeared to be having a fish kill with an algal bloom. So dead fish are just piling up on the shore. And about... 10 yards away, there's a creek. So I go down to the creek and there's a series of impressions. So what I honestly think happened is something was coming up the creek. To, it smelt the dead fish, was looking for dinner, and these guys were just in the way. And they were convinced it was a ghost. And it was taught, probably tossing rocks at them to try to get them to move. Then uh, the other one was two side, two different sightings less than a week apart in the same WMA in Arkansas. And one of them got reported to MUFON and the other one got reported to a, a Bigfoot group. Uh, the first one, there was a deer hunter that went up into this WMA. And the story goes that he... Uh, was, he was really interested in aliens. He watched all the ancient aliens and listened to, you know, coast to coast. The story goes, he says he saw a eight foot tall, gray, hairy alien walk across the road in front of him. And then he had missing time. Well, a week later, a, then again, this is now that we're getting to the one that was reported to the Bigfoot site. Another deer hunter goes into that area and he says he sees two gray Bigfoot walking down a trail nearby. So why would the first guy have missing time? I honestly think he fainted. Wow, that's uh, that's interesting. Um, people confusing or mis misidentifying based on what their frame of reference is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and the reason I honestly think this, this uh, first witness fainted was what deer hunter you know you know outdoorsmen tend to be fairly fairly macho guys what active outdoorsman is going to admit he fainted so did he wake up in the same spot or was he in a different location when he came to it, same place he was in the seat of his truck he said he blacked out and if, if there was for five minutes he says he had missing time well, I've heard of missing time before with a lot of people, you know, with, whether it be with UFOs or or even with Bigfoot. I've heard of some people, you know, thinking they have missing time. And, and we don't always know what transpired because they have no memory. So, you know, it's it's hard to say. Um, and it very well be that that they're blacking out. It's just really hard to say where they go in this missing time period. Uh, but the fact that he was in the same spot um, is also interesting because oftentimes they're driving and they're in a completely different location or they just wake up and they're in a completely different location and have no idea how they got there. Well, the fact that he was in the same spot in his truck and it was only for about five minutes, again, I tend to believe the guy fainted. Mm -hmm. Right. So these are two locations, one in Oklahoma, one in Arkansas, where people have possibly misidentified um, a Bigfoot for a ghost and an alien. And... Um, Maybe they're just, they don't even know if uh, anything about Bigfoot. I know before I started doing my interviews about a little over a year ago, I had very little information about Bigfoot. 
um, so that they could be just um, not familiar with what this, what Bigfoot is like, what it looks like. So what, um, what are some of the more interesting discoveries that you've had regarding this subject? I mean, this is, it's a broad subject, but it's becoming very, very, um, I guess, like kind of like a, a, a niche uh, following there, there are a lot of people getting more interested in Bigfoot. Lots of information is floating around out there. What is what are some of the things you've learned and know about the subject? Well, this is kind of again, this is kind of broad strokes. We know that people have this idea that there's you know that they just you know, you'll have single individuals wandering around. That does not appear to be the case. There they seem. Based on the data that we have gotten, they seem to be in family units. And I, we honestly think they might break apart in a little feeding, what we call feeding groups. Because you'll have a sighting of two or three. And obviously two or three is not a family unit. That's just a, a couple of them that wandered off. But we see that in multiple areas. Uh, we know they'll use distraction. Uh, a lot of times if you've got one that you see, it's deliberately trying to get your attention so you don't see what the other ones are doing. And the perfect example, we were up at a place up at Ulaga Lake in northern Oklahoma. It was freezing cold. It was probably, I believe it was six degrees and... I got there kind of late and I just set my tent up and set my ice chest down on the ground and went to go warm up by the fire. And one of the members turned in and his truck, he uh, was sleeping in his truck and he turned it on to warm it up. Well, when he turns it on, the headlights come on. And me and a gentleman by the name of Lim Weaver and there was another guy there, uh, Rob Gaday, I believe. He, uh, we were all kind of looking out in this field because it looked like there was some kind of a mass out in the field. And uh, me and Lamb both had little night vision devices. So we started looking at it through the night vision devices. And the, we were, we had about decided it was a log until it moved. So we're watching this, that we, this thing that moved. So we now know it's not a log. And uh, behind us, we started hearing dove calls in the middle of the night. And it started out, oh, 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 oh. and it kept getting louder and louder and louder to the point where it's basically, coo, coo. And uh, Lim had went to go get one of the other members to let, who was leading the expedition to kind of let him know what was going on. Well, about that time, the guy in the truck who had no idea this was going on killed the truck because it was warm and the lights shut off. And when it did, I flashed the, the uh, IR illuminator on my night vision to get a better look. And as soon as I did, through the, through the night vision, an arm comes up, grabs some brush, and pulls it down over it. So, but the fact remains that the, the louder calls that we were hearing at the edge of the field, I think we're trying to get our attention off of the one in the field. I think what had happened is it was making a rain on the ice chest. And because it was heading straight that direction, when the lights came on, it basically pinned it. So I think it just hit the dirt. Exactly. So have you ever seen any craft or orbs out when you're out in, in researching this at all? No. Nothing at all. Yeah. I mean, some people see things and some people don't. So I always ask the question. So you don't see any correlation between this Bigfoot in the woods and um, and UFOs at all? No. 
No, and I've honestly seen some people try to jump through some really spectacular hoops to try to make a co uh, correlation. There was one gentleman that was trying to say that there was a Bigfoot sighting and a UFO sighting in the same night, and that was proof they were connected. Well, I asked him how close the UFO was to the Bigfoot sighting. He said it was 380 miles away. <laughs> That's quite a distance. Yeah. Now, for me to say that there would have to be some kind of connection between UFOs and Bigfoot or Bigfoot and, you know, paranormal, actual paranormal events, I would probably have to see it myself. But based on what I have seen, what the, what, uh, the research that we've done, I would say probably not. Well, what else? Is there anything else you want to, um, to add to, um, to the interview? Any other information that you would like to, to talk about? Um, I will say this. Don't be afraid to talk to people because a lot of times you can get really good information from people if you just you're willing to talk. You just got to be willing to deal with deal with the hits that come with it. As in ridicule or not believing or ridicule. There was uh, one guy. Whenever I would talk, uh, I used to work at it again. It was that warehouse I worked at, but it it pretty much had a revolving door. We were getting new people in and out of there all the time. And there was one guy, whenever I would talk about Bigfoot, he would get downright violent. Finally, one day he walked up to me and he apologized because he said I was forcing him to admit what he saw to himself. Apparently, he had, was driving down the road and one started to cross the road and tried to hide and failed miserably at it behind a road sign. And he'd seen it and, you know, he'd just seen this big hairy thing that was basically trying to hide behind a speed limit sign and he didn't want to admit he saw it. And every time I would bring it up, he would get, he'd be forced to uh, admit it to himself and he did not like that because, you know, people that see Bigfoot are crazy, right? Yeah, sometimes it, it's very difficult for people to to go there in their minds. It, it just isn't their norm, and they they don't want anything to shake that up. You know, they, Bigfoot shouldn't exist, and and it's a it's a frightening thing to to observe. Yeah, that's see one of the one of the things I have found is it seems to help the witness whenever you actually talk to them about it. The other thing, I do, I'm, I'm a bit of an artist and I like to do sighting report sketches. And I find that also seems to be kind of therapeutic to the witness because a lot of these people were rattled by it. And yeah, I get to do a sight, I might get to do a sighting report sketch or get new information, but in a way I kind of, kind of, looks like I get to help people too. And that, to me, that's a good thing. Yeah, it's very good. I think to, um, it's kind of therapeutic, like you said, to be able to, to get this out. And if something that you're, you're kind of shying away from, it's good to have a, a an avenue to be able to, to talk about it and share that. Right. Sounds like you, sounds like you offer that through, through the drawings. Well, I'm going to go ahead and end our interview today. I thank you very much for sharing all this information. And um, I'll let you know when this comes out. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.